What's good, homies? It's your boy Q here. Uh, riding solo today. It's just me, no Kev. So uh, allow me to uh, to soothe your souls with just uh, my voice today. Yeah, so the homie Kevin won't be here. Uh, but nevertheless, this is going to be, I think, a really fun episode. Uh, I figured that for tonight's episode, I had to think, like, so out of all the episodes that we have planned for uh, for this month, which of the episodes would Kevin uh, mind not being on the most? <laughs> uh, because actually, July is a really stacked month for us, so there's a lot of really fun stuff that we got planned. And uh, it, it, it's always easy for us when, like, the planner fills itself out because of what's happening and, like, cultural events. But uh, nevertheless... I figured that Kevin probably wouldn't mind if I did the Loki episode solo. Uh, so tonight's just going to be me, Solo Dolo, talking about some of these Loki episodes. Uh, so, so far on the podcast, we've only actually covered Loki episodes uh, one. <laughs> That's it. So uh, episodes two, three, and four, I'm going to talk about here tonight and uh, kind of talk about my thoughts on it. Talk about where I think the show is going to head. Uh, will I get any other predictions spot on? <laughs> Things of that nature. Uh, there's only two more episodes left, so we'll see what happens. But uh, there is a little bit of housekeeping I want to do first. Uh, so before I get too far into this thing, I do want to uh, uh, pay homage and, and, and you know, pay my respects to uh, Richard Donner. Richard Donner apparently passed away uh just recently, I believe, just earlier today. And, of course, Richard Donner is the uh, fantastic director, a uh, legendary director. He directed movies such as uh, The Goonies, Lethal Weapon, and, of course, Superman and Superman 2, uh, specifically the Donner cut of Superman 2. And uh, to some extent, I've actually spoken about Richard Donner and about his uh, his Superman movies and the controversy surrounding Superman 2 and how they got a different director to basically reshoot half the damn movie and to take Richard Donner's portion out. And then, of course, years later, we got the, the Donner cut of Superman 2, which I think most people will agree is uh, vastly superior from the theatrical cut. Now, I'm not going to get on here on, on these microphones and start capping. Uh, I've said it before, and I'll say it here again. My favorite live-action incarnation of Superman is Man of Steel. I really enjoyed Henry Cavill's and Zack Snyder's uh, interpretation of Superman, and I've always maintained and stated that I understand why people don't like that version. And that's because traditional Superman fans, I, I would imagine, don't like the uh, Man of Steel Superman because that Superman doesn't have the same I idealistic nature or viewpoints that the traditional canonical Superman does, uh, specifically from like the 70s and 80s. You know, that version, version of Superman was very idealistic. Uh, his morals came above all. He always had a solution and could make sure that everyone was safe and sound and the problem would be solved by the end of the issue. Whereas the Man of Steel, Superman was a more uh, uh, grounded approach, whereas what would it be like if this alien kid really landed in Kansas what about the identity crisis, no pun intended, that he would face? And that's really why I love the Man of Steel Superman so much. It's because it really begs the question, what would this person be like? But Richard Donner, what he did was he really encapsulated the Superman of that time. Richard really took the tone of, of the Superman comics and put that on film. And I think that, you know, whether it be for better or for worse, and again, I, I haven't really been that big of a traditional Superman fan, but I've always appreciated Donna's approach. Um, and it's funny, guys, I kid you not. Uh, just right now on my phone, I got a, a Twitter update uh, where Zack Snyder says, thank you to Richard Donner. Can't make this shit up. Uh, but no, uh, Richard really did a lot for pioneering superhero movies. And I don't remember which episodes. It may be years ago when Kevin and I covered Man of Steel on the podcast uh, where we did a, a retro re review of that movie. It, it may be on that episode where I gave Richard Donner his flowers for what he did for not only Superman, but for comic book movies as a whole, uh, because he really did pave the way. I mean, at the time, you know, in, in, in the seventies, when we got those movies, there really weren't 
any other superhero movies that were kind of leading the way. So the the Donner movies were really iconic and they really did pave the way. And of course, Donner did a, a lot of other fantastic movies. You know, I, I mentioned Goonies and Lethal Weapon earlier, but of course, with this being uh, the Superhero Homies podcast, you know, the thing that really cuts the deepest is the Superman movies. And so I've always have uh, a deep appreciation for those movies. And I, I, I do like those those films, those first two uh, that Donner did. Uh, so it is unfortunate that uh, that we lost a, a great one today. But, you know, Richard, he, uh, he he made it to 91 years old. And, you know, I think that most people would agree that if, if we could all make it to 91, that'd be that'd be nice. You know what I mean? Make it to 91 uh, healthy and happy. And uh, he, he leaves a legacy behind him and uh, shoes that would be hard to feel. So, you know, Richard Donner, here's to you, my friend. Uh, you have made an impact on myself and on all the homies. And we thank you for your contribution to the world of movies and superheroes. So another thing I wanted to talk about, guys, is uh, I will not only be doing this episode solo, uh, we'll also be doing a Patreon episode solo as well. I'm pulling double duty tonight, guys. So by the time that most of you hear this, uh, the next Patreon episode will be up. I'll be talking about a nightmare on Elm Street. Um, so really, I'm going to be focusing mostly on the 2010 remake, but I'm going to be talking about the franchise as a whole and kind of the direction that they took. So even though superheroes and comic books are my bread and butter, I I think as a kid, I also really cut my teeth on horror. Uh, I really love horror movies. Specifically, I love movies from the 80s and uh, from the 70s. You know, you guys probably have heard me talk about the Alien franchise and also the Terminator franchise and the RoboCop movies. I, I <laughs> as, a, as a small child, I really did enjoy watching movies that I probably shouldn't have been watching. And uh, those were, those horror movies were definitely uh, um, among the, the top of the list, I would say. Uh, but for the first time today, I watched the 2010 uh Nightmare on Elm Street movie because I had actually never seen it and believe it or not that up until maybe I would say two years ago I hadn't even heard of that movie I didn't even know it, it existed so I was very surprised to know that there was another movie out there uh, with Freddy Krueger and I wanted to check it out and I did and if you guys want to hear my thoughts on that and on the franchise as a whole and on how where it really waxed and waned and what I think they should do next in the future you definitely want to be sure to check that out, guys. And again, that's going to be at patreon.com backslash superhero homies. And uh, that way you guys can, can listen to not only that episode, but all of our awesome content uh, that is not superhero related, but it's similar in tone and structure. So if you like this type of talk and you're a nerd in other areas as well, I can't recommend it enough. And of course, that's one of the best ways to support us besides leaving reviews, liking and subscribing, that kind of thing. Uh, but with that being said, I think we're ready to get into this one. Uh, and with this being just a solo episode, this one probably won't be as long as uh, our episodes typically are. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and get in here and get out of here. Uh, so let me pull up uh, the uh, episode list. Here. I, I like to have the, the names of the episodes uh, that I'm talking about here uh, because that I don't know, just kind of helps me uh, put a little bit of distance between each episode. Uh, but let's see. So the last episode we talked about was episode one uh, and episode two is called uh, the variant. Now, just a quick recap with uh, episode one, you know, Kevin and I, we, we had uh, similar feelings on that episode where it didn't really do anything for either of us. You know, it didn't really help enhance our excitement for the series didn't necessarily hurt it either maybe it did maybe that's a lie uh, it kind of hurt it a little bit uh loki episode one man was was definitely a, a mixed mixed bag for me mostly because it uh i don't know man it, it it really tried to break loki down in a way that just didn't sit right with me and one sin or maybe that's too strong of a word. One problem that I have with the, the series as a whole is that too often, specifically with this show more so than Falcon and Winter Soldier or WandaVision, but with this Loki TV show, man, there's too much Disney and not enough Marvel 
And what I mean by that is that they they just seem so hell bent on letting us know that you know you can change, you can do better, you don't have to, you know, be the the person that you were before and blah blah. But they they keep trying to sell Loki as this decent human being when a he is not decent and b he's also not a human being. He's a goddamn god. Uh, so <laughs> let's go ahead and get that straight. And, uh, you know, uh, and I'm not trying to pigeonhole Loki into just being nothing more than a uh, metaphorical mustache twirling villain. But I also want, you know, don't want to gloss over the fact that Loki's done some really horrendous things. And you can't just undo those things in a single episode. Hell, I don't like the way that they've, uh, quote unquote, progressed his character throughout the films. You know, I, I thought that Tom Hiddleston was the standout star in Thor one. And, and that's saying something because Anthony Hopkins and Chris Hemsworth did a tremendous job in Thor one. Like all three of those guys did amazing. But Tom Hiddleston as Loki, his acting, like his performance and the writing for that character was phenomenal. Uh, he stole the show for me overall. And that's saying something. And in Avengers one, he was still again, really fucking good. And I really enjoyed him there. And then after that, uh, things get interesting with Thor 2. And, and then, of course, you guys know how I feel about Ragnarok as a whole. Um, I, I did like how he died in Infinity War. I thought it was, I thought that was a very fitting death. How we got there was just a bumpy road, is what I'm saying. And with, with this Loki TV show, man, like they, they keep trying to almost gaslight us into, into thinking that no, look, is a decent guy. He's good. You know, he's, uh, he just, he's dastardly. And Oh, that gosh, darn Loki, you know, I tell you what, he gets up to mischief at times, but he's a good person. That's really what the show keeps trying to push. And I'm like, superhero homies rule. Number one is holding true to the integrity of the character. And Loki is always going to look out for Loki. That's point, point blank period. I mean, I think in uh, in episode one, I mentioned how I was reading through uh, Loki Journey into Mystery. I was reading that that comic book run, man, and that, that really is a tremendous run. And I'm not I'm not going to spoil anything that happens in that book here, but man, there's one twist in there where Loki really fucking does like <laughs> it's super vague what I'm, what I'm saying, but he does something so goddamn dastardly that I didn't even see it coming. And, uh, you know, that's really saying something because I thought for sure that I, I, I kind of knew the caveats of that character and what, you know, the, the kind of despicable things he was capable of. But here we have a book that I'm referring to where Loki is the titular character. And the, some of the things he does, yes, is good. But at the end of the day, Loki only does things to benefit Loki. And there are times, there are occasions where he has you know, these bouts of, of maybe grief or where he realizes that, okay, maybe what I did wasn't the best or maybe there's other nefarious reasons as well. And I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole talking about that because trust me, I can, especially since Kevin isn't here to rule me in. <laughs> but I say all that just to say that, you know, Loki in this regard, he really, in in terms of the TV show, I, I, it's, it's too much, again, I just have to say it again, there's too much Disney and not enough Marvel. Um, just because he's the titular character doesn't mean that he has to be this completely redeemed, reformed character. There's different ways of progress than this. Now that I've uh, gotten that out of the way, and by the way, this isn't the first time that Marvel has done this. Even with WandaVision, they did it. You know, they... Uh, they, they pulled back the curtain on, on Wanda Maximoff. You know, they realized that, okay, well, we don't want people to really view her as as a villain villain, so we're going to throw in Agatha Harkness. And, you know, the, the whole thing with the sympathetic villain or the villain who's not a villain or the reformed villain, blah, 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 you guys know what I'm saying, it's just getting really old. Uh, and to an extent and to different degrees, all three of these Marvel TV shows have done so. Carly Morgenthau was definitely another one where sure, she's doing bad things, but look at the reason why. And it's like, none of this shit really has resonated with me. And you're, you're shooting yourselves in the foot because there, there's nothing wrong with having somebody being bad for the sake of being bad. Sometimes there's just fucking bad people out there. Uh, and again, I don't want to go off on a tangent, but you know, you look at 
people like Obadiah Stane from Iron Man 1, one of my favorite movies and one of my favorite MCU villains. Doesn't get talked about a lot. But his uh, his role in that movie was fantastic. I mean, he felt undercut by Tony Stark because after Howard died, Obadiah thought that he should be the one to run Stark Industries, sign those big, fat military contracts, get all that money. That's what he wanted to do. And then Tony Stark comes to find out he's alive and he's this reformed, changed man now. And he no longer wants to deal in the military industrial complex and he doesn't want to sell weapons of war anymore. And, and that's going to, you know, cost the company money and that's going to cost OB money. And so, you know, he goes behind Tony's back and he devises his whole plan. And I mean, really, it fucking works. It's simple, but it's so effective. There's no moment throughout Iron Man 1 where Obadiah's like, yeah, you know, Tony, I really, I really do care for you, man. And I did this, you know, for, <laughs> you know, for hey, spend it however you want to. There, there, there's no real redeem, redeeming qualities to him, and there doesn't need to be. Uh, anyways, now that I've gone off on several tangents before I've even gotten started, episode two I, uh, of Loki, I actually really enjoyed this episode. I enjoyed it a lot more than episode one. Uh, episode two, mm-hmm. I just had it pulled up here. Let me pull up again. Yes, right. It's called The Variant. And this is uh, the episode where uh, Loki and Mobius, uh, who is played by Owen Wilson, uh, they're able to piece together essentially where and how this variant is, or they're able to piece together like what the variant is doing and how the variant is hiding. And the variant, they find out, is hiding amongst different apocalypses uh, because essentially like with, with the, the pseudoscience or magic, wherever they, they perform their measurements, it's not really showing up there because uh, it's like, it's an apocalypse event that, that's happening there. So nothing would read abnormal to the TVA. Uh, but so Loki is able to, to piece this together with, with Mobius and these guys, they go there and they, they check it out. And man, I really love the aesthetic for like the, uh, the third act of this episode, man, where they're in the, uh, when they're in that grocery store, that hardware store, whatever kind of uh, appliance store it was. I really love the aesthetic there with the storm going on on the outside and also knowing that all those people, were, they're going to die. Like this storm is going to just ravage them. Uh, the, the aesthetic, man, and like the uh, environment and the atmosphere, I really dug that. Uh, and then, of course, you know, we uh, we, we get like these, these kind of um, almost creepy moments where we have the variant Loki who has kind of a different slate of abilities than the Loki that we know. And this Loki is able to uh, almost like assume control of other people uh, and, you know, in a way possess them to an extent. And, and so they, they play this whole game and it's like, who is this, this variant? Where is the, the, the actual variant body? Where's the host? And and then you know we get the reveal and, and uh, it's uh, Sylvie, and uh, yeah it's it's the uh, it's it's Lady Loki, uh, so you know I don't want to say you know, I don't, don't want to brag too much on that but I mean I I did call it, <laughs> and um, this is one of those cases where I wish I wasn't so right like. I wish I was just half right and not all the way right, but I was all the way right. And now, you know, going into episode three and some of my gripes with mm-hmm. it, man, what I mean when I say I was all the way right was that uh, when we covered episode one, I, I didn't just say that we were going to get uh, Lady Loki. I said that we're going to get Lady Loki and she's not going to really be a villain, but she's going to be this misunderstood person who who has you know uh like unresolved trauma and and she you know she's really not a bad person and and i mean like really <laughs> i was spot on but let's be honest it's not that hard to call because again marvel has done that two times in a row now three times in a row so it, it wasn't that hard to call um and i'm not really sure why we keep getting this same kind of treatment uh, but it, it just feels uh, a, a, a little lazy. But before I go off on episode three um, and the, the the whole, you know, Loki and Sylvie roadshow, uh, 
With episode two, though, that's a whole, man. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I really enjoyed it because it, it kind of broke down almost like a police procedural where it, they're figuring out the case. They're, they're looking at the evidence and they're, they're piecing things together. It just happened to have a very cosmic backdrop. And, you know, I, I really, I, I dug that. Um, I I was a little concerned about the show, you know, in, in episode two, because uh, I thought that they were going to lose track of who Loki is. And because episode one, I, they completely fucking lost track of that, you know, with making Loki the butt of the joke and of every joke and, you know, having to always undercut any moment of tension with another joke. And I'm, I'm just, I'm kind of choked out, you know, it's joke at the instead of your storytelling is, is not storytelling, but yeah, in episode two, though, man, that's a whole, I, I really dug it. Um, Owen Wilson, man, he's so phenomenal as, as Mobius. And, uh, you know, th- this is this is another case, another one of those rare cases where the live action version is more enjoyable than the comic book version. Uh, but then again, that's not really fair to say either, because, I mean, <laughs> how, how many issues is, is Mobius really in in the comic books? It's not that many. The, the TVA isn't even in that many episodes in the comic books. So, you know, it's, it's not a whole big thing there. Um, let's see. Uh, so, yeah, episode two, uh, as a whole, man, I really dug it. Of course, the big reveal at the end um, was something that I'm sure that I didn't only see coming, but probably most of you guys saw it coming too. Uh, and, uh, yeah, at that point, I was really curious to see what happened when those two, you know, uh, left through uh, through the, the time portal thing together. Uh, episode three was by far my least favorite episode. Uh, I just downright disliked episode three. Uh, that was lamentous. And now, uh, this is probably where I'm losing a lot of you guys because I, I think, judging by, like, internet responses, this seemed to be, like, the most popular episode. <laughs> so it's kind of crazy because uh, I did not like episode three. Uh, episode three really showed how much Owen Wilson was helping carry this show uh, because he wasn't in episode three and the show and the episode, uh, I don't, I'm not going to say it sucked, but it damn sure just wasn't for me. Uh, this episode was doing nothing but undercutting Loki as a character, Loki as a God of mischief, instilling so many human characteristics and the God of mischief and really having him be the straight man to Loki or or to Sylvie's, uh, you know, mischievous ways. And, and, you know, it, it just didn't sit right, man. It, I wasn't invested in Sylvie's story. I'm still not invested in Sylvie's story. And so much of the episode was really dedicated to that. Um, seeing those two, you know, form a, a bond in the relationship, uh, a weird kind of romance where you fall in love with just, just jack off Loki. I mean, it's the same goddamn thing, isn't it? Uh, but, just, you know, seeing those two, like, form a relationship and whatnot, and I don't know, it was just, uh, this episode didn't do anything for me. And I hesitate to call it bad, uh, because I think at the end of the day, this episode and maybe this show just isn't for me. And maybe I, I, I'm not like who this show is, is aimed at. And, uh, you know, at at risk of, of repeating myself or saying something ad nauseum, I mean, too much goddamn Mickey Mouse in this shit. But, uh, yeah, so, th- so this episode, you know, it, it really just this episode only exists to, to form the bond between Sylvie and Loki. Yeah, it really just exists to, to really form that bond between those two. And, uh, it, yeah, it it didn't do anything for me. Like all, all of the moments that was supposed to, I don't know, make me laugh or chuckle all the moments that was supposed to make me feel some type of way, they just all feel flat to me. And uh, it's nothing against uh, any of the actresses. Uh, obviously, uh, I love Tom Hiddleston. Uh, the actress who plays uh, Sylvie, 
I forget her name right off top, but she's also, uh, I think she's doing a really good job with what she's uh, been given. Uh, well, oh yeah, Sophie D. Martino. Uh, I think she's been doing a really good job with what she's been given. Um, unfortunately, she's been given dribble. <laughs> I mean, yeah, let's just you know call it what it is. Like, I, I think that the the ultimate red herring would be if she wasn't a Lady Loki variant, but if she was actually the Enchantress, somehow manipulating and playing everybody. Uh, and, and like the the only thing that that I can kind of give evidence to support that it's not even a theory it's just almost at this point it's more of a wish but the only thing I can say to support that would be Loki falling kind of in love with her that's something very enchantress you know what I mean like enchantress she's not going to uh uh she's not going to you know out mischievous Loki but uh she will out charm Loki and she and enchantress would have that capability also, the fact that Sylvie is blonde, and I mean that's a very small thing as well. But again, like this isn't a, a theory that I have; uh, it's just more of a hope. Because uh, if, if Enchantress is here, then I mean I think that's, I mean that's that's a great. Thing. Enchantress is one of those Thor villains who I thought we would have long gotten by now, and I'm surprised that we haven't. You know, I thought that for sure. Uh, that Thor Ragnarok was going to have uh, Enchantress in it, you know, especially since Scourge was there. I thought for sure, yeah, this is definitely going to be uh, Enchantress. And then, of course, it turned out to be uh, Hela. But anyways, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, Ravana and uh, and her character, Ravana Renslayer. Uh, this is uh, an interesting character here. Um, she is actually uh, in the comic books, and, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, kind of how like, and, uh, in WandaVision, like from the start, everyone kind of knew that, uh, that, uh, that what, what, what's the neighbor's name? Agnes, uh, whatever her last name was that we all knew that she was going to be act of the Harkness, you know, like it was a very thinly veiled disguise, you know, <laughs> we all kind of saw it coming. Um, to a lesser degree, it's kind of the same thing here with Ravana. You know what I mean? Uh, and, and I thought that the show did a very good job uh, with with actually kind of hiding uh, her name because honestly, like, um, I think it was uh, the homie Caleb who sent me a text message about uh, um, about Ravana, uh, but he, he, you know, he used the name Renslayer because that's the name that we saw her mostly referred to in like episodes one and two was always Renslayer. That's her last name, her first name being Ravana. And then when I said these two names together, they did kind of ring a, a slight bell, but I couldn't fucking place it. And so I had to look it up and see like, where do I know this name from? And then of course hit me and then I saw it. Oh, that's right. Uh, she was at one point a romantic interest for Kang the Conqueror. Uh, so this is another one of those instances where, yeah, we're, we're definitely setting up for something here. Uh, I do think that obviously Kang to some degree is going to be behind this. Now, whether it's Kang or whether it's Immortus or whether it's, you know, any of his other, uh, names that he uses, he's definitely going to be involved somehow. And I do want to talk a little bit about Kang the Conqueror, uh, a little bit later on here. Uh, but anyway, back to uh, episode three. Uh, yeah, so Lamentus. This was, uh, yeah, like I said, my least favorite episode. I mean, we just see those two uh, bonding, those two being Sylvie and, and Loki. We see those two bonding and, you know, uh, there there are some good bits. And, and the good bits we get are through the form of exposition, uh, this is when Sylvie says that, you know, everybody in the TVA is a variant. And uh, the reason why I, I like this is because it undoes a tremendous sin from episode one. It, it's something that I'm surprised more people weren't upset about. I spoke about this a little bit in our episode one review, uh, but I absolutely hated the TVA in episode one. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and that's mostly because... It, it's not just because 
is different from the comic books, but it's because the TVA and this T in, uh, in this Loki show, they're just fucking that they're fate sealing assholes. There, there is no free will with this version of the TVA. If you do something that they deem to be outside of their, uh, you know, uh, approved sacred timeline, then they fix it. And I'm like, that's completely different from the TVA and the comics. The TVA and the comics, if you do something that that is detrimental or threatening to that timeline to some degree, or if you, you know, blatantly do something that fucks up the timeline then they have to step in line and fix it. It's not like if you make a decision that they don't want you to make, then they get at you. No, if you do something that is a threat, a danger or a blatant fuck up to the timeline, then they get at you. And so that was, it may sound like a small thing, but if you think about it, it's a very big thing. And it really rubbed me the wrong way in episode one, uh, because they're basically saying that, yeah, if you don't do what we want you to do, then you're erased. I mean, that's what it is. Uh, but here in episode three, like one of the few things I liked about it is if the, if the TVA, uh, like the Minutemen and everybody who works there, if they're all variants, then that of course means, uh, that the timekeepers are liars, which of course means that the TVA is an evil organization. And again, uh, the TVA has to be an evil organization because neither of the Lokis would be the villain. So, uh, and, and you know, so the TVA is an evil organization then that means that what they're doing then is blatantly wrong and marvel disney isn't so goddamn uh you know ignorant to think that uh controlling fate through what they deem is right and wrong uh is the appropriate thing to do so that that was definitely i'm glad that's that that was something that they recognized uh was a very uh uh, cynical uh, viewpoint, so to speak, because nobody, nobody wants that. Like, you know what? Uh, I'm I'm gonna have. I normally have vanilla ice cream, but today I'm gonna have chocolate. And the goddamn TVA Minutemen come out of nowhere and and prune my ass because oh, according to the second time timeline, I'm supposed to choose uh you know vanilla every single time. Uh, but anyways, uh, I'm glad that they they have cleared that up uh, because yeah, that that's a very uh, thought it was a very dumbass thing to to have instilled, but uh, to Marvel's credit, they obviously knew that and you know set it up from the beginning. Uh, yeah. So episode three, I uh, not gonna say I hated it, but I'll just say wasn't for me. Wasn't for me. Uh, episode four. This episode, I actually really enjoyed. This episode, I think, is probably my favorite episode. Uh, which is good because, you know, episode four, that means we're starting the back half of the season. And, you know, so if, if I just look at the show from episodes one, two, and three, I'm not on board. Like, as a whole, I'm just not on board with the show. Like, episode two was pretty good. Didn't like episode one. Definitely didn't like episode three. Episode four was very redeeming. Uh, Episode four was definitely my favorite. And it is called the Nexus event. Uh, So with this episode here, uh, I really liked how we were able to, uh, we were able to, to further kind of the nefarious plots of the TVA and of, oh yeah, Ravana. Shit, I never, you know, talked more about uh, her role in the comic books. Uh, oh, no, I, I, I did. I said that. I said that, yeah, she was a love interest of, uh, of King the Conqueror at some point. And, uh, yeah, and uh, I, fuck, I had forgotten about that because you read so many goddamn love interests sometimes in comic books. You don't remember all the names, specifically ones who you don't read about that often. It's not like she shows up that often. So it was, it was very uh, interesting that they chose to put her in the T in the TV show. And in this, uh, in this manner, um, she did have a lot of red flags from the beginning that, yeah, she, there's definitely something, uh, afoot with her. You know, there's, there's definitely something, uh, not good guy ish about her. She, she's definitely up to some nefarious shit. Uh, Owen Wilson, again, man, I think that he still has to show in this episode. Uh, I think that his performance, man, is, uh, is top notch. 
the the scenes that he has with Ravana were just excellent, man. Like he, like the, those scenes between he and Ravana, they, they they didn't feel like you were watching a TV show. It felt like a conversation. You know what I mean? It felt like like two people who know each other who just shooting the shit and whatnot and. I really dug it, man. Like Owen Wilson is really chewing the fat in his scenes, man. He's making the most of what he's been given, and uh, I, I really, really dug it. Um, when he got pruned, man, like it, it stung a bit, you know, because I was like, "Damn, there goes like one of the best parts of the show." And then, of course, spoiler alert! But spoiler alert, by the way, if you guys haven't seen all these episodes, I know I'm about thirty six minutes or so too late, but uh, yeah, if you haven't seen it. Then, uh, yeah, spoiler alert. Uh, yeah, so I, I was really taken aback in, in, in a good kind of way, you know, when uh, when they killed him. But then they uh, did the same thing to Loki, and I was like, okay, yeah, so they're both definitely coming back. Um, you know, at first when, when Mobius, uh, you know, was pruned, as they call it, I uh, I was willing to possibly believe that Marvel would be ballsy enough to let that be it. And then maybe we see like uh, another variant or like the true Mobius enjoying a life on the jet ski in like episode six. Uh, but no, when we see Loki bite it, then I'm like, okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> like th- they're clearly not going to keep Loki off screen. You know what I mean? Uh, they're definitely bringing him back, and which means they're, they're bringing Mobius back. Believe it or not, I am drinking milk. Milk. Does the body good. Uh, anyways, this episode, man, uh, had, I had a lot of fun with. There was um, still some things about it that I didn't you know, really care for. Again, I could give a fuck less about the Sylvie storyline. I'm just, I'm so through with the sympathetic villain uh, fake outs, blah, blah, blah. I, I, don't, I don't give a shit about that. Uh, and, and to an extent that also applies even to Loki, man, I'm like, I, you're just so unrecognizable at this point. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, I, don't, I don't know, but, um, yeah. So with the scene at the, uh, you know, the end of this, uh, of this episode, when we get, uh, Sylvie and Loki, you know, working together, and then we get uh, the the one uh, Minuteman agent, what was her name, B-15, I think, who comes down and, you know, she sacrifices herself to get, uh, uh, to, to free Loki and Sylvie so that they have a fighting chance, and then uh, Sylvie decapitates one of the timekeepers, and then we see that the timekeeper was actually just a, a robot, some kind of automaton, and then it's like, who's really behind the timekeepers? And, uh, you know, will it be King the Conqueror? So here's the thing. Um, yes and no. I, th- <laughs> I know you guys love that answer. I think that, yes, it will be King the Conqueror. Uh, but I don't think we're going to actually see him. I don't think that John- Jonathan Majors, that's the actor who's playing uh, King the Conqueror. I don't think that he's done any kind of... Uh, any kind of screen testing yet. I don't think he's done any kind of, you know, actual MCU type work as Kang yet. Like not any kind of recordings or any kind of filmings or performances yet. Uh, I, I mean, hell if Marvel did, that'd be like the best kept secret. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, cause typically something like that, you will see an article, Jonathan majors, uh, was, uh, found on set, uh, on the Marvel lot or, something to the extent, but no, um, what I think we're going to get is a representative of King the Conqueror, probably with Anna, honestly. I mean, and then this incarnation in the MCU, she's probably obviously working with the actual King the Conqueror, maybe, at, maybe even as, as his lover, uh, we, we don't know yet, but, uh, we'll definitely get, I think a name drop. It may be Kang, it may be Mortis, uh, it may be one of his other aliases. Uh, it may be Ramatut. Uh, it, it could be any of a number of, of Kane the Conqueror names. Um, but we will get a Kane name drop, I think. And, 
you know, we'll see what that leads to. Um, but with this show, you know, only having uh, two episodes left, you know, I got to say, man, like, unlike, uh, unlike Fal- Falcon and Winter Soldier, two episodes left feels appropriate for this show. Like, it feels like with what they have, they can tell the story they need to tell with two episodes. Um, yeah, that, so that, that timing feels appropriate. Uh, I hope that these two episodes can keep me engaged, uh, as much as episode four has. And, um, again, man, it's, uh, it's, it's sad for me to say, but the only character who I'm, remotely interested in it was Mobius. Uh, I lost interest in Loki. I don't have any interest in Sylvie. And I mean, the cast cast isn't, you know, big enough for me to really have an interest in anyone else. So it's not, it's not the characters who I'm invested in at this point. It's really just the story. It's the story that I, I'm looking forward to seeing unravel. Um, I mean, to get me wrong, I am curious to see what happens with Loki, what happens with Sylvie. I, curious to see you know how their face end up um i mean hell we may get like a, a disney for to a happy ending for those two who knows they may just ride off into the sunset together uh all i know is that yeah with, with these you know even with episode four man um and and again i i do also want to acknowledge the fact that i recognize i'm probably alone on this hill you know as far as not giving a shit about loki or sylvie in this, in this TV sh- series, but I mean, it's just such a far cry from who the character Loki is. Uh, and it's, it's such a fall from grace. And I know that some of you are screaming, but that's the point. It's supposed to be a fall from grace. Uh, yeah, but at, at what cost? Uh, the, the character of Loki has been like a, a metaphorical, in some cases, literal punching bag, uh, of of a barrage of jokes and uh, of being you know undercut even in his own TV show and the the Infinity Stones don't mean shit and you know everything he wanted to do was a joke and uh, you know he goes from you know having fucking these literal godlike powers and even super strength to being taken down by, you know, Minuteman guards in episode one of the show. I mean, there's, there's, it's death by a thousand cuts is really what the show is. It's like, there's not, there's not a whole lot of big things, but it's so many small things that the show does. And then just, you know, one or two kind of major things that really are holding the show back for me. Uh, this is the show that I'm have been least invested in, honestly, like, and again, I don't want to say that this is a, a bad show. I'm trying uh, to use, you know, that that B word less and less. Um, and I'm trying to look at things more objectively. And and I think what it comes down to is that, again, the Loki, TV, the Loki show may just not be for me. Uh, it, it, maybe the show just wasn't made with, with me in mind. Uh, I don't know. But as these Disney shows go on, man, it's like, I think that Wanda Vision is by far the best, and I had problems with that. You know, like the the way that Wanda is, in, uh, the way that Wanda Vision ended was, you know, just slinging CG boats back and forth at each other, and I'm like, this is a far cry from how the show started. How do we end up here? And and also Wanda, you know, she's not a bad guy, even though she has done some terrible things, but that's okay because she's moved on now. Her grief is being being handled and. I don't want to shit on these shows, man. I don't, but none of them have absolutely bl- blown me away yet. Uh, you know, in a couple of days, Kevin and I, we're going to go see black widow and we're going to sit down and we're going to talk about it. And we're going to be honest and tell you what we thought about the movie. And, you know, I'm hoping that that's the movie that, you know, brings me back to being like, you know, MCU poster child. I'll be that if, if they deserve it. But I also be the one who hold, who's like the MCU uh, fucking protester, you know, if, if that is also what it calls for. Um, but if I'm being honest, yeah, um, WandaVision, Falcon and Winter Soldier, and so far Loki, none of these shows are bad. None of these shows are great. Uh, 
these shows are very middle of the road. And uh, I think that so far, yeah, uh, WandaVision is still ahead of the pack by a little bit. But, yeah, so that's that's kind of where my thoughts are at so far with uh, with episode four. Uh, again, episode four, definitely, definitely my favorite episode of the bunch so far. Uh, curious to see, again, what happens next. And uh, if more curious to see uh, how they wrap this thing up here. Um, yeah, this is one of the few times where I, I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, like what this ties into. Typically with, with Marvel products, I, uh, I get upset with them when they focus more on tying into their future products than they do focusing on what they have right here and now. But in the case of this Loki TV show, yeah, I'm just more, more so looking forward to seeing what you have in store for me in the future. Um, but yeah, guys, uh, so I'm definitely curious about what you guys think about the Loki TV show. Uh, so go ahead, uh, tell me how I'm wrong and how, uh, this show is amazing and how, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm a fucking gatekeeper or, or whatever you guys want to say. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I really don't give a shit. Uh, but yeah, I, I am curious to hear what you guys think, though, about the TV show. Uh, maybe you guys are seeing things from a perspective that I am not. Um, all I can say, man, is that when Wednesdays roll around, I'm like, oh, yeah, Loki's out. I'll probably watch it tonight. <laughs> you know, that's kind of where my thoughts are at with it. And I'm like, that's not how it should be with the MCU product. I should be stoked whenever Marvel releases anything. And man, uh, that, uh, that fire has waned, has waned, but you know, it's not the end of the road. It's not too late. We'll see what happens. Um, yeah, guys. So that's all I have for my Loki review. And, uh, I, I already plugged this, uh, you know, just a few minutes ago, but yeah, we will be seeing black widow in a few days. Uh, and I'm very curious about this movie. Very curious. It's funny how uh, how a year can change things. If you guys recall, for any of the long time listeners, in uh, at the end of 2019, when Kevin and I did our uh, homies award, and then we you know we looked at the movies that were supposed to come out in 2020, and then we did our prediction ranking, and of course that's when we look at the movies that's coming out in the following year, and we predict the order from like worst to best that we think the movie is going to fall in. And I said that black widow for 2020 was going to be the best superhero movie of that year. Uh, black widow was at the top of the list. And of course, you know, black widow and ha literally half the other movies didn't come out in 2020. And, uh, Kevin and I, we, we did the list again in early March before any superhero movies came out for, uh, for this year. And this year, uh, for me, Black Widow failed drastically. Failed to about the midway point, I think. Maybe a little bit less. And, you know, it's again, it's just funny how time can change things and perspective. And, yes, and, and you know, I'll say this here, um, and then I'll let you guys go, but I think the reasoning for that is, is just because I've had a lot of time to think about potentially what this movie could do. And uh, all of my potential thoughts are just more or less potential fears <laughs> for the movie. And, you know, also just the fact that, uh, you know, this is true. The thing that's been said so many times before by so many other people. And I hate to, to echo something that's been said countless times but yeah okay black widow should have received her movie years ago we all know that but uh you know despite that though i still had a lot of faith for this movie you know just a year ago and now today i'm like i don't know i'm really nervous about this movie but again uh we'll see what happens here uh but that is uh my thoughts about the loki tv show in a nutshell um and again, let me know what you guys think about this. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I forgot that I really wanted to uh, to touch upon. Um, there probably is, but uh, as with all things, uh, I'll probably, 
remember it as soon as uh, I hit the record button so that I stopped recording. But <laughs> uh, I think that's going to be all for me for now. Um, this has been, again, a lot of fun, guys. And I hope you guys enjoyed uh, listening to me rant and ramble about the Loki TV show and, and about, uh, you know, other things as well that I've talked about and throughout this past 50 minutes or so. Hopefully, guys really had a, a blast with this. And uh, hopefully, uh, a lot of you guys will hop on over and join me uh, for the Patreon that I'm about to do. Uh, again, and that Patreon is going to be me talking about the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, but specifically focusing on the 2010 remake. So if you guys are horror buffs like myself, then uh, definitely join me there. That will help us out a lot. Uh, you know, you, you guys' support listening in also always helps us out. And uh, yeah, go ahead and share us and, and tell your, your other nerdy friends about us. Hell, you know. In 2021, you don't even have to be a nerd to like superhero shit. So tell everyone you know about us. Uh, that will help us out a lot. Help us out with the algorithm. And yeah, just help some people to see us. But that is all for now, homies. Thank you, thank you, thank you again. This is your boy Q. I am signing out. Uh, but until next time, my friends, I'll see you later. <laughs>